Our scripture reading today is from the book of 1 Timothy, continuing with that study. We're going to read chapter 1, verses uh, 3 through 11. 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 11. Paul is the writer, and he says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, Remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Father, as we look into the word today, we ask for your insights. Help us, Lord. This is a, a difficult little passage on the way everything goes together. Pray that you would help me to explain it in the best possible way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our study last week, we uh, continued to get an introduction to this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. And we, and we saw that Paul instructed his younger pastor protege to remain in the city of Ephesus and to get some matters inside the church there, a church that Paul himself had planted, to get those matters into right order. For there were people inside that church that were teaching uh, unsound doctrine. And that was the point of verse 3. In verse 3, he said, As to Timothy, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now I understand that the word doctrine is not a word that causes people's hearts to flutter with anticipation. I'm aware of that. When I was an interim pastor in Cuba a number of years ago, a woman in the congregation came to me one day and she said, I don't really want to hear sermons on Bible doctrines. I just want you to tell us what we should do and how we should live. And I get that. We all want to know, ultimately, the answer to the how then shall we live question. That, that's a big question, isn't it? We are, are we conducting ourselves in a manner that pleases God? But understand this. Understand that doctrine is to your spiritual life as your bones are to your physical life. If your bones are not healthy, if they break or are malformed or start to decay due to osteoporosis or bone cancer or some other malady, the, life of, the quality of life that you have is going to suffer. Your bones are important. They are a huge part of maintaining order in your body. They bear weight. They hold everything in place. The, the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, they're all dependent on the health of the bones. The, the marrow of the bone even produces 95% of the blood made by your body. Now likewise, if your Bible doctrine is wrong, or another way to say this is, if, you believe, if the things that you believe about God are wrong, your spiritual life will be a mess. 
Bible doctrines are the spiritual bones. The reason your uh, sound doctrine is important is that it holds everything in the right place. So job one for a pastor, for Pastor Timothy or any other pastor, needs to be about teaching sound doctrine. A major part of that, it will be able to show people how to actually apply it in real life. Now, I don't care how wonderful a pastor is. If he can't teach or won't teach truth, um, I don't care how wonderful he is. He can visit the sick, he can run a nice food pantry, he can be a fine administrator, or maybe even do some counseling. He could be a friend to everyone. He could get along with the other ministers in town. All well and good. But if he does not soundly teach the truth about God, he is a shepherd who is leading his, his sheep astray. He should not be a pastor. Teaching truth is job one. And that is what Paul is telling Timothy. Look at verse four. Verse four of First Timothy chapter one. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now, last week we discussed that there are actually three ways to really mess up the truth. Add to the scriptures, take away from the scriptures, or ignore the parts of the scriptures that one has issues with. As we read verse 4, it sounds like, like there were some really cultic happenings that Timothy was dealing with in Ephesus. It starts with, with adding to the scriptures. Fables, genealogies, those are the favorites, by the way, of cults. The Mormons come to mind immediately. Genealogies are a huge part of their salvation plan. And they also have all kinds of fables in their religion. But they're not the only ones. This is, this is especially true now in the hyper-charismatic circles today, where many such churches are constantly teaching about, uh, about new things, that is, new doctrines that they are getting, supposedly, from angels. From angels. Now, you may not be better, uh, very aware of some of these things, but this new revelation has become a huge deal in an increasing number of churches. And yes, we do have them even here in western New York and all around New York State. These angels, if they are actually being seen by some of these pastors and teachers as they claim, these are in reality demons. There is no question about that. They are not holy angels from God suddenly bringing new revelation after 2,000 years. Rather, they are deceivers doing their best to undermine the truth of God's word, not to enhance it. Look on in verse 5. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Paul's command to Timothy to set things in order in that city, that, that, that church, is because he loved the people of Ephesus. He wanted to end, put an end to the deception growing among these people. You see, Ephesus wasn't just another place to Paul. Now, I'm sure no church would really want to be considered just another place. But Ephesus was special to Paul. He put in a lot of sweat equity in Ephesus, perhaps more than any other place he had visited. Watch this in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 10. This is speaking of Paul himself, and it says, When he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Paul spent at least two years and three months in Ephesus. 
Three months going into the synagogue, two years after that going to the school of Tyrannus to, to, to speak to people. And from that place we're told that the gospel spread throughout the region of Asia, which of course is short for Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. So, so in his years there, you could be sure that the apostle formed lifelong friendships that he had developed, and, and he had a super love for the people of Ephesus. And when things began to go south there, shortly after he had left, he sent Timothy to be their pastor, to get things in order. So look again at, at verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Notice that Paul's command to teach no other doctrine, we saw that was the command back in verse 3, to teach no other things besides the truth already given to us in the scriptures, is tied to godly living. Paul uses the words here, love, a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith, in other words, godly living. But watch, verse 6. Verse 6. From which some have strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. Idle talk is the opposite of godly living, or at least it's the start of such. Uh, the Greek word for idle talk gives the sense of a being the talk of fools. Such talk never leads to a good place. And yet look at, at what these foolish talk talkers wanted to do. Verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Now, want to know how to really mess up a church? Just let anyone teach. Let certain people with little or no discernment teach. Let folks with the biggest mouths be the leaders. That, that was apparently what had been happening in Ephesus. And Paul called upon Timothy to go in, clean up the mess. I am thankful to the Lord that I have never felt anything like that in this fellowship here. No one seems to be trying to take over and lead in a bad direction. Never felt that way. It's not that everyone necessarily sees everything here the same, but there's a respect for the word of God in this fellowship. I'm thankful for that. But I have been in such a situation uh, on more than one occasion. Once, I was visiting a church as a pulpit supply for that day. Okay, the pastor, that church had no pastor, um, and uh, so they invited me to give the message. I walked in for the very first time, and I could feel the tension in that building. During the worship service, there was such a sharp disagreement between two men that I literally thought that a fist fight was about to break out during the service between the two of them. One of them was actually leading the service, and the other one got up, got out of his pew, came down in the front to oppose him. And you could, you could see that he was starting to cock his arm back and he was ready to bring forth his fist and punch the other fellow in the head in church. When thankfully he thought better of it. I later found out that there was a terrible division in that church between those who believed the Bible to be true and those who didn't. So I don't know how the church arrived at that point, but somewhere along the line, somebody didn't take care of business and allowed people who had no right to teach and or lead uh, to do such and gain a foothold. And, and the ministry suffered greatly in that place. And all I could think is, man, I'm glad God did not call me to such a place. That would be a hard ministry. And yet Timothy was called to a similar situation in Ephesus. When other things besides the truth of the scriptures are taught in the church, bad things will definitely come to pass. Now let's look at verse 8. Verse 8. But we know 
that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now, what's Paul talking about here? How, how does this fit in with what he just was saying about false teachers? Well, it goes back to uh, godly living versus ungodly living. Why did God give people the law? His people. Why did he give them the law? Well, he did so because the law defines right and wrong, doesn't it? The Ten Commandments, all the laws of God in the Old Testament, godly living versus ungodly living. Last week, when we looked at some of the silly laws that the Pharisees enacted, the biggest issue was that the Pharisees began to view the actual keeping of the law as an end to itself. In other words, according to the Pharisees, you were righteous if you kept the whole law, and you were unrighteous if you didn't. Your eternal destiny actually hinged on, the, on how well you kept the law, according to the Pharisees. My friends, that has never been the purpose of God's law. Never. The reason why God implemented the law is twofold. First, the law is a gift given by God to make society a place where people can live safely. If we all follow the scriptures, no one gets hurt, right? We all look out for one another. Children are cared for. Women are kept safe. Where the law is followed, the rules of such a society give structure and order and care. The second purpose for the law, which is actually the greater of the two, is that when we understand how comprehensive the law is, and how difficult it is to keep, and how the law points to the holy nature of God, our conscience is pricked. And we understand that we can we just can't fully keep God's law, no matter how hard we try. We transgress parts of it regularly. We fall far short of living up to God's holy nature. And because of this, we recognize that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And as a result of understanding how demanding the law is, this, this knowledge causes us to seek after God. Just trying to keep God's law brings us to understand our own sin. Watch how Paul puts this in Romans 3, verse 20. He says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. No one is made righteous by keeping the law. That's the first part, and that's what the first part of this verse means. No one's justified by it. You are never made right in God's eyes by keeping the law. But the fact that we, the fact is we break it all the time, if, if not in actual deed, then actually in our thought life. And it points out that we're sinners in need of a Savior. So the law is good in that it strips away our self-righteousness and shows us how far we fall short of God's standards. Now watch where Paul goes with this in his letter to Timothy. Chapter 9, or I'm sorry, verse 9, uh, just the first part of verse 9. He says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. The law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and the profane. Now, how could Paul say this, that the law is not made for a righteous person? Well, to answer that question, we have to understand who a righteous person is. The only people who are, who are truly righteous are those who have come to faith in Christ. Paul puts it really well in his letter to the Ephesians, I'm, I'm sorry, to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 9. Paul says about, about God and about Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God, by faith. Paul recognized that he was righteous, but that his righteousness came through faith in Christ, not from keeping the law. Let me illustrate this. Once upon a time, there was a woman 
who had a very harsh husband. And every day before he went to work, he would hand his wife a list of things to do. A very exacting list, very demanding. Clean the house in a certain way. Paint such and such a room. Don't spill a drop. Take care of the lawn. Do it exactly the way I say. Do the shopping. Go to these stores only. Get these products only. On and on the lists went. Another list was handed to her every single day. There were no days off from, from getting another list. Now, in case you didn't notice, there, there's no love in this marriage. All it is for this woman is work. Always more work, just trying to satisfy a husband who can't be satisfied. It was drudgery. It was a sorrowful existence for this woman. And then one day, her husband died. And after a while, the woman was married to another man. And this man, he was so different. He loved his wife. And he gave her no lists. He cherished her and lavished his love upon her. And the wife became joyful from the time that she woke up in the morning to the moment she fell asleep at night all because of her amazing husband. Well, one day she came across one of those old lists that was given to her by her first husband who had died. She read it over. She smiled. And she crumpled it up. And she threw it in the trash. For she realized that she was doing all those same things for her new husband. But she was doing them out of love and not because she was told to do them. What a difference love can make. My friends, that's the difference between law and grace. Those who come to Christ for forgiveness and, and those who enter his family find out quickly that he is love. And, and the response of, of the Christian heart is to love him back. As the Apostle John reminds us, we, he, uh, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. Because of the love of God, because of his Holy Spirit, who actually lives inside of us and guides us into all truth, we don't need a law to make us want to do the right things. Rather, we want to do them because of what's already happening inside of us, because we love God. Without understanding, look again at the verse, 1 Timothy 1 9. See, I'm going, here we go. 1 Timothy 1 9. <clears throat> Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for those, the, for the ungodly, for sinners, for the unholy and the profane. Just take that first part. The law is not made for a righteous person. Why not? Because the righteous person, a person who is truly born again into the family of God by repenting his or her sin and trusting in Christ that he paid for those sins on the cross, that person doesn't need the law. We will already want to do the right thing. But then you read on the rest of it, in, who it is made for, the law, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and the profane. This, this includes everyone who does not know Christ. They need the law to keep them in line. They need to recognize that there are teeth to it, and if they don't do it, there's going to be punishment. You see, they're still married to husband number one. Husband number one is the law. And yet they have not come to know husband number two, Jesus Christ. Now Paul also goes on and points out the difference between right living and wrong living. 
the difference in the, in the life of the person not married to Christ compared to the person who is. Picking it up in, in, uh, in the middle of verse 9. He says, For the ungodly and sinners, for the whole unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my sight, my trust. So th this, uh, this really, you know, it's amazing how many times the Bible spells out the, the nature of man's sins. In our previous study, where we were working on the second coming of Christ, we saw this roster of sin in Revelation 21, then we saw it again in chapter 22 of Revelation, since the roster of the, the condemned, it's called. And now we see it again here in 1 Timothy. Paul makes particular reference to murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, and manslayers. And I'm sure that this is a, a literal condemning of murderers. But the Apostle John gives it a wider meaning. In 1 John 3.15, he says, Whoever even hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. John heard Jesus say this at the Sermon on the Mount. And he repeats it here for us. If you have hate in your heart toward another, it's viewed by God as having that same spirit as a literal murderer. Let's look back, let's get back to the, to the list of sins that Paul was, was detailing. Um, it includes fornicators and sodomites there in verse 10. In other words, sexual impu uh, impurity. And by the way, the Greek word there for uh, sodomites is arsenikotes, and it literally means man lying down with another man. There's no other way to render this than that it speaks of homosexual activity. And Paul condemns it here. Paul goes on. Kidnappers, liars, perjurers. What's the overall point here? That the law of Moses, given over a thousand years before Christ, came in part to keep in check the sinful inclinations of man. And in the Jewish nation, it did that as long as people recognized the law coming from God. And even then, even knowing it was from God, people struggled to keep it, even as people do now. And in that struggle comes the realization to some that the heart is, is so wicked that we would even think to do some of those things. So here's the thing. The law of God given to Moses impacted man's outward conduct. But it was never meant to make the man better uh, in his heart. Rather, the law was meant to show man that he's sick in his heart. Keeping the whole law, even perfectly, if that were possible, cannot cure him. You know, the law is really like a thermometer. A thermometer. It takes man's temperature. It tells him that he is sick. But it has no healing power in itself. So what does all this have to do with Timothy? How should it impact his role as a pastor to the church in Ephesus? What, what did Paul want him to do here? Well, it really goes back to, to verses 6 and 7 uh, in, that we've already read in chapter 1, and we'll, we'll end with these. Chapter six, uh, 1, verse 6, from which some having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Now, there were people who wanted to teach about the law of God, and yet they didn't know what they were talking about. They did not understand that keeping the law was not a way to holiness. They, they did not understand that God uses it as a protector of society as a whole, and, and, and greater than that, that God uses it as a tool to show man that he needs Christ. So Paul wanted Timothy to confront such false teachers and get things in order that the church in that city would continue to be a lighthouse, a lighthouse leading people to the saving power of Jesus Christ. 
So point number one about the church that we learn in this early part of the book is that the church is to be a place of sound doctrine, sound teaching, a place where one can come and find truth. Ultimately, the church is the place where a person can come and meet the God of love and be saved. If a church fails to teach the truth, the whole truth, it's a failure in one of the most important parts of why God called it into existence in the first place. Now there's more to the church than just teaching. As we move on in this study in future weeks, we'll see a number of important aspects that we, the church, should be in our community. The world needs the church to be the church. The world does not need the church to become like them, but inviting them to meet the living God who so loves the world.